Welcome to Wisdom Exchange TV, Ignite Excellence Foundation Initiative, in support of Africa Business Women Connected Summit, taking place in Ethiopia in 2013. The Wisdom Exchange is a forum to aid African women to learn, lead, and succeed in life, business, and community. New interviews and expert perspective blogs will be updated regularly, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an interview with the leaders of today for tomorrow. Hello, my name is Suzanne F. Stevens, co-producer and host of Wisdom Exchange TV, as well as the president and founder of the Ignite Excellence Group of Initiatives. One of our initiatives is the Ignite Excellence Foundation, and our mandate is very much about leadership, advocacy, and education. Our vision is to inspire, invest, and develop women in emerging countries. We are in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, with our very special guest and leading lady, Miaza Ashinafi. Amongst many other accomplishments, Miaza was identified as one of the five prominent women rights activists worldwide. Miaza is now empowering women by leading the newly formed Ennet Bank Mother Bank. The bank works to develop the income generating capacity of women in Ethiopia. Welcome, Isa. It's so good to meet you and to meet a woman that has really stood up for women, not only in Ethiopia, but internationally. Now, what was the catalyst for being pursuing a career in women and children's rights? What started that? <laughs> uh, I get that question a lot, but um, there is no specific incident. I, I think my training as a lawyer uh, played a very important role, I think. Uh, that uh, opportunity was the uh, adoption of the Ethiopian Constitution in 1995 and uh, the establishment of the Women Lawyers Association that sort of followed the adoption of the new constitution at that time. What was it for you that actually made you want to become a lawyer? I was intuitively, uh, I used to like to protect people, I used to like to protect my siblings, I, I used to like to support uh, you know, domestic workers and uh, there was something in me that always uh, pushed me to, to, do, to protect. Uh, I was uh, born and raised in a rural town, like 800 kilometers from the center, from Addis. And uh, I came to the center, to Addis Ababa, when I was uh, 17 years old, to join college. Uh, but even before I joined uh, the university, uh, there was something about me from, from the beginning. So it's sort of a natural progression, taking one of your strengths yeah. and really celebrating that and utilizing that in your career. Now what continues to motivate you to continue to fight for women's rights? I think I was uh, lucky in terms of uh, being able to mobilize people, uh, being able to define agendas, define issues, being able to win the trust of uh, people, especially women. And so I feel I'm to some extent uh, responsible to continue to speak on behalf of women, speak on behalf of uh, uh, vulnerable uh, young adults and women who are victims of rape, who are victims of protection, who are victims of female mutilation. In short, I feel I'm responsible now, what would need to happen for you to feel you've achieved your ultimate objectives when it comes to women's rights? Women empowered economically. I want to see more women in decision making, both in public and private sector. Uh, I want uh, women to speak up against abuse, against violation of their rights. I want to see women taking more agency than what they agree. What would you see the biggest injustice done to women in Ethiopia? But I think violence against women is a huge problem. There has been a lot of uh, public awareness, legislative reform uh, to fight uh, crime against women, but it is still a huge, huge problem. And uh, that, that would be my, my number one priority. And at another level, again, there's agencies, oh, yes. their participation in decision making, mm -hmm. both in public and in private. So it is improving, there are some improvements, but still uh, we need more uh, representation of women, not only representation, recognition, as well as redistribution of power and resources. Violence um, against women is one of your, your 
primary mandates. What needs to change for that to be addressed? I believe we need to work at uh, three levels. Uh, the first one is uh, the enactment of uh, comprehensive laws against violence. Uh, we have laws that prohibit violence against women, but we don't have comprehensive laws that address every aspect of violence against women. For example, women in marriage, they are not protected. There is no laws that protect women in marriage, specifically. Uh, secondly, it's about law enforcement. We need to train our uh, police, we need to train our judiciary, we need to empower them. They need to act, you know, they need to respond to the situation of women victims. And at the third level, which is very difficult, is change of norms, the social attitude and the norms, customary and traditional attitudes that sort of accommodate violence against women. Could you give advice to a woman mm -hmm. that is in that situation, mm -hmm. that economics does that dictate if there's violence or not? Uh, in many cases, yes. I mean, when women are uh, empowered economically, I think uh, they'll be free, theoretically at least, to live abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. But that's not always the case. That's not always the case. Women who are self-sufficient or even who may support the family could be abused. Mm -hmm. So my advice would be uh, to women, it's, it's never to allow it. It's not as easy, I know, but they should never believe that situation will improve. When they continue to live in a violent relationship, believing that the relationship will improve, we have simple principles. Mm -hmm. When they get killed, they, they get the all kinds of uh, you know, damage, physical damage, and uh, the consequences is very bad. So they have to sort of study the indications and try to take action as, as soon as they can. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they don't know where else am I supposed to go, so they keep going back. So what is that center called that they could go to? It's a uh, center for abused women, for women victims. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, shelter houses. We don't have adequate mm -hmm. places for women to come. That is one of the problems. If these women continue to be abused, stay there, if they have da daughters, yeah. they start seeing that as a norm rather than the exception to the rule, which yes. then perpetuates the same sort of thing, empowering women, perhaps economically. Where are some of the biggest challenges to make that happen? Mm -hmm. uh, I think education and uh, access to health care is key, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a lot of effort and, uh, on the part of the government also to ensure that uh, there is good education access to health care, especially related to uh, maternal care. Uh, but as of well this, I would still uh, believe that women's agency is critical. Uh, in are um, sort of uh, they're disadvantaged because it's a disadvantage because this is a traditional society, religious uh, and uh, customary uh, norms greatly influence the uh, participation of women, the voice of women, and uh, women are still bound to domestic, uh, domestic work, uh, the care economy, and uh, there should be uh, intervention also to sort of push women to uh, go beyond this traditional boundaries, uh, go to school, and go to uh, enterprise activities. Uh, so uh, their agency is again key. Element. When you look at a, a country, there's agencies, there's government, and those things take time. And if we always wait for those things to happen, mm -hmm. it could take years before a change occurs. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any advice on what, again, what women can do themselves mm -hmm. to start changing their their circumstances? Um, to empower themselves. Organizing is, uh, is, is key because uh, as an individual you could do a number of things, I know, but when you have organization, when you are part of a society, uh, when you have skills and tools 
to uh, use the media uh, to outreach to other women. I think that's, that's quite important. And the kind of work that you're doing, leadership training, is, I think, the key to empower women. Um, leadership is not about women having a formal position, no. Wherever they are, women will be leaders. We have leaders in the community. We have leaders in the workplace. And the, 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 those are like key agents. And I think it would be important to empower this kind of women so that they really can change agents. So I think that, that that's also a key component to change and transformation. Do you have any insight or advice to those women that are, can be leaders? What could they do in the community to demonstrate their leadership ability. Take initiative. When you see something, don't say, oh, this happened to her. I'm sorry. You know, don't feel helpless. Do something about it. Mm -hmm. And that's missing, unfortunately, in any case. Mm -hmm. Do something about it. Which country do you think has really changed the plot uh, culturally and perhaps in regards to empowerment of women? Well, in Africa, I think in terms of uh, participation in the agency. I think Rwanda is always our example. In Rwanda, uh, we have 58% uh, of uh, women's participation in the parliament. And uh, we know the history. We know what happened in Rwanda. That's the least. I think they are uh, overcoming their challenge and they're giving more um, opportunity to women. And they're contributing in a variety of ways, uh, influencing decision property of social services, uh, budget prioritization, access to education for girls, and that they have the voice and that they are speaking. Uh, Rwanda is one example, and um, I think also South Africa is good because of their tradition uh, in fighting apartheid. They, are, they know how to organize, they know how to influence political processes, and uh, the AMC has been supportive in terms of uh, bringing women to decision making positions, both at the parliament level and uh, at the level of the cabinet. In any case, we have about eight or nine African countries that have women's participation. The critical mass participation of women in the parliament, which is over 70%, and Ethiopia became one of, one of the countries. Which is wonderful. Yes. What's interesting is if you your answer to that question was very much about who's in government. Yeah. Because that's where the change can, can happen. Yeah. And having more women involved in yeah. policy making will really impact yes. that change for uh, the injustices and violence and things along those lines. Yeah. And ultimately, what role would you like to see women possess in society? I think uh, women should be uh, able to play every role that, that men have been able to, to play. Space because I represent 50% of the society and uh, our governance structures, our uh, business structures should reflect that composition. I think that's that's quite natural. Do you see any consequences to that? Uh, you mean negative consequences? Yeah. No, I don't see negative consequences, but um, in, in, in my context, in our context, but also globally, uh, there are some. Uh, issues like in, in some countries, uh, girls are we, are we are having more girls at the higher education level, and uh, the number of boys is coming down, and, uh, and that is that is a cause for concern. Mm -hmm. But in our case, we still have to go long way before we begin to worry about those issues. Now, I read that you felt that women didn't have enough organization to put pressure on the government. Do you still feel that's the case in Ethiopia, that women aren't organized enough to actually pressure for what they need? Women are organized at different levels. Mm -hmm. uh, we have mass organizations of women, and uh, we also have NGOs, like, uh, you know, interest groups organized around NGOs. Uh, I believe both are important. The mass associations are important to sort of trickle down the message, to mobilize at the grassroots level and so on. And we also need professional associations and NGOs to sort of catalyze, to do the research, to do the analytical work, and to catalyze change. 
So uh, we need to reflect uh, literally between the two. How are we doing in terms of coordination? Do we have enough organizations that are doing the analytical work? We need to discuss in some of the sense. Otherwise, uh, we have the basic framework. What would have been sort of some of the biggest challenges for you in pursuing women's rights? The biggest challenge is uh, you don't see transformation of replicate. Mm -hmm. uh, the issues that I have been fighting uh, for over the last 15 years I've stayed there, They're, they manifest in different forms and they persist. And uh, sometimes uh, we're working in for social transformation is not easy because it takes time. You, you need different inputs to make them work, and, uh, and I think that's, that's one of the challenges. I would find that very frustrating <laughs> because when you, when you like to get things done, that could be challenging. So how do you how do you overcome with that? How do you deal with yeah. something you've been working on yeah. for years yeah. and it's still? Yeah. How do you deal with yeah, that? It's not easy. It's not easy, but. Uh, when you're an activist, you understand. You understand those things. You also learn from the experience of other countries and other organizations. And um, you try to build on your efforts, you try to build on the efforts of other people, and you just continue to fight. There's no other way. As an activist, you, know, you, you sort of know the parameters of what that means. That you're not going to get change overnight. It is a process. Yeah. So you, you have to, one little success is a success. It's yeah. a movement forward. So, what do you see as the biggest challenges to achieve equality for women moving forward? I think um, women's education is key. And uh, property ownership, for example, access to property, including life, or uh, access to lunch is a major problem for women. So women need to go to school, uh, they need to go out, have income, they need to have property, and their uh, legal rights have to be protected. Whether it's with the marriage or with divorce, they have to, their legal rights have to be enforced. Has education is, uh, for women has it increased? Yeah, definitely, especially at the uh, Primary level, right? Yeah. Secondary level is also improving. When I was at the old school, I was the only one for my, for my class. Now you, you mentioned in regards to land ownership, which is sort of a great segue to discussing your involvement with Etna Bank. Why did you decide to get involved with creating a bank? And if you could also tell us what was sort of the biggest challenge in doing that and how did you overcome it? The establishment of this bank in that bank came up as a it's a casual conversation uh, with one of the women entrepreneurs. And uh, the more we thought about it, the more it made sense. Uh, because uh, women mostly operate uh, within the micro, medium, and small enterprise. And it's not easy for those kinds of uh, business to access uh, finance. Uh, we have private banks, uh, we have government banks, but our banks are operating in a very traditional fashion, which is like for a woman to go to the bank and get finance, she gets a collateral. You need to have a building, you need to have a villa, you need, you need a solid collateral. In most cases, women cannot do that because of two reasons. Number one, they don't have property. Number two, even if they have property, that property might have been used by the husband to get money from the bank. And also traditional attitudes. When women go to the bank uh, to get uh, finance for their project, from what I gathered, they are asking, Who's, what is your husband? Are you sure you're going to finance this project by yourself? So the whole environment is not quite encouraging for women. So we believe in this project. Uh, we use uh, it's, it's a fantastic idea. And uh, 12 women, we got together and we begin to think about it. And uh, we sort of designed our roadmap, but uh, implementing the vision was a huge challenge because 
none of us had experience in health uh, marketing or in, 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 in the banking sector. We come from a different background. Women entrepreneurs and other professionals. But we insisted, we were stuck for about one year. We were stuck for about one year because uh, I didn't find the key selling point was an issue. Uh, I didn't find the right staff to implement the project was big talent in uh, selling the share. It's a talent. But nevertheless, we never gave up, we never gave in. We succeeded in July 9th, the bank was launched. It was a great, great satisfaction. So, is that bank predominantly then for those women? The bank for all. It's a universal banking. But 64% of the equity is owned by women in uh, the bank through this uh, credit policy we want to be more innovative and we want to address small and medium enterprise and we want to focus on women entrepreneurs as much as we One of the things that uh, you know we hear a lot about microfinancing, we hear about investing and we know that this this mobilizes women where they never had the opportunity before. So yes. it's, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Who's going to help those women from mid to becoming larger so they can employ more people that will also change the economic situation and law of the communities that actually exist? But I know some initiative where they uh, try to sort of help uh, the small, sort of small and medium enterprise. Um, for example, I was at a meeting yesterday, uh, the DFID, um, the United Kingdom Overseas Development Program, have, uh, is designing a program that actually does this. Uh, they want to help women entrepreneurs. They want to help uh, companies that focus on employing 80% of women. And companies are 80% of women in their, yeah, in their uh, companies. And uh, I also know about the uh, World Bank program that uh, have allocated uh, $50 million for Ethiopia to support uh, women entrepreneurs. I don't know the detail, I don't know how it works. But there are these initiatives. And also, there are some international banks that provide guarantee funds for local banks that are interested to finance women's projects. So there are these opportunities that women need to have this information. They need to be connected to the information and they need to exploit uh, these opportunities and uh, they, they need to use it to their advantage. So I'm a woman entrepreneur, I want to start and I need financing. Yeah. What do I do? Uh, well, it depends on the kind of business that you want to start. Number one, you have to identify your niche. When you think about your project, uh, you should try to be you know, a sort of original product. Uh, and you have to also take into account that your project, your, uh, your projects, you know, have that social social edge to it, like employing women, and it's also environmentally friendly. I think if you come up with this kind of project. There, are, there is support in terms of capacity building, uh, technical assistance, and also access to finance mm -hmm. because you can, you can sort of apply for this kind of guarantee funds. Yeah. I have noticed women that start businesses here, that is part of the equation from the start. Yeah. It's okay, how can I impact other people? Yes. And how can I environmentally do this? Yes. Which is a very different paradigm to start businesses yeah. from, which is a good good thing. More on you, you know, women. What has been the most significant impact you feel you've made in your um, career? I think uh, our organization, the Women Lawyers Association, uh, played a key part in terms of uh, legal reform in this country. Uh, we managed to do research and to public opinion and to present uh, uh, the case to the government in terms of discriminatory law, what needs to be done in terms of discriminatory laws. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were part of um, the initiative uh, uh, which has led to the reform of the Ethiopian family law, uh, the reform of the criminal law, the reform of nationality law, 
and uh, other uh, relevant laws to women's rights. And secondly, I also feel that uh, the legal aid program that um, has been supported for the last 10 years is a very important contribution, particularly to the women. The legal aid center is still there, and uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's all over the country mm -hmm. where we are supporting the women who doesn't have access to uh, legal aid. So, I think those are um, important contributions. And also, the whole um, effort to make uh, women's rights a national, national, national agenda, to name violence against women. When we started, there was no name for violence against women, but we gave the Amharic name to that. That, that, was not, that was not in the dictionary. I think uh, the Women's Rights Association and the leadership and also I feel, very, I feel very happy that I'm part of this initiative, the Women's Bank, because uh, this is a unique initiative. There are women microfinances across Africa, but formal commercial bank, we, we, don't, we don't have them. So if this project is successful, I hope it will be successful, it can be replicated in other countries. So it will set an example, mm -hmm. saying that women should go beyond microfinance. With all that success, if you could attribute your success to one thing, I think I am committed to the cause of women, respected women. It's just, it's my 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 focus is just that goal. Whatever I think is can contribute to that goal, I think I'm for it, and I don't like to quit whatever I start. I like to finish. I am very stand. I think that's my sort of strengths. Do you have any advice on for other women that are trying to figure out what their purpose actually is? This is an important process for myself. We should uh, continue to reflect in our internal strengths. What is my internal strength? We should never settle. We should never get an answer. We should always reflect about the internal strengths. And uh, as we go along, we will discover what our strengths and uh, we build up on that. I think that is a process. We need to push ourselves beyond our comfort zone. And it's okay to be nervous. Uh, it's okay to be to feel anxiety because that makes us work. That makes us think. That makes us shy. Mm -hmm. So that, that too is fine. Just because we're nervous about a particular thing does not mean it doesn't work. It's just not to And uh, whatever I do, I, I did it because of the support I get from them. I can't wait to by myself. And I consider myself lucky in that sense. But also, uh, you get that support when you're nice to people. For me, it's always easy to be nice to people, and it's always good to be fair. It's interesting, before the interview started, we talked about leadership lessons. Yes. And these are your, to conduct your purpose is the same as your leadership lessons. Yes. Which is really interesting because uh, I've never looked at it that way before. And, and to hear that if you're conducting your purpose, mm -hmm. you are leading. Yes. And to be a good leader, you should be conducting your purpose. Yes. Because they're one of the same. Yes, you have to know your quality. So I call this the, the edginess segment. Edginess is a Susanna F. Stevens term, meaning something that you've had to do that has made you uncomfortable. Yeah. But you've had to do it in order to be successful mm -hmm. and you continually will have to do it to be successful. Yeah. Can you give us something that you've been uncomfortable doing but you would not be where you are today if you did not address that discomfort? One of the things that uh, comes to my mind uh, when we talk about discomfort and other things that I had to do uh, was uh, especially of uh, the Women Lawyers Association in 2001. Uh, the organization was uh, suspended because uh, we were uh, pushing uh, to get justice about particular women who were who was a uh, victim, victim of violence. And uh, I understand we were too vocal about it and very mobilized public opinion. Uh, we took particular government official in the So uh, I was asked to um, sort of retract my statement, to put stop 
to what the goal of getting that point. And uh, we did not feel it was right to do that. And we had to continue. And our organization was suspended. Mm -hmm. So we had to again continue to fight. It was not easy because that had consequences at the time. But we had to do it. And uh, when our organization was suspended, uh, we went to the court and uh, we found finally a remedy after six weeks of uh, mobilization and uh, uh, you know, waiting for a uh, court decision. So that was one of the uh, challenging uh, moments in my career. What would you say would be the most significant thing that happened to you or for you to achieve your career accomplishments? I was lucky uh, because uh, I was raised by a very quite strong. Uh, my mom was quite strong, quite strong mother. Uh, she didn't have an opportunity to go to school herself, uh, but she always believed in education. She was quite strong, she always pushed us. I think that was one of my advantages. Secondly, I had a very good mentor when I was working with the Constitution Commission. I, had, I was privileged to work with a very senior person who was a minister during the Emperor's time, quite educated with high stature, and he was my mentor. And uh, I think he sort of helped me to construct my values in life, the meaning of life, and uh, what I should you know, focus and prioritize in terms of living a complete life uh, um, as per my definition. How significant is having a mentor to one success, do you think? Um, I think uh, it is very important. I think we have we have two windows of opportunities as we form our personalities. One is the college age, I think, 18, 25. I think the formation is, is quite crucial. And secondly, um, mentor, especially during the early part of your career, having a good uh, mentor. I often encourage people to have maybe not a mentor but a, a group to talk to later on in your career mm -hmm. because we always can learn from yes. somebody else oh, and, and I guess that's what Wisdom Exchange is all about yes. because it's not only about women that are young coming into business yes. but women can learn from others' experiences. What does success mean to you? Success for me um, is um, contributing to the better to be able to speak uh, on behalf of the Bangladeshi, to be able to contribute to make the world a better place for everyone. Yeah. To define leadership, would it be any different than that? I think that would be my definition. Contributing to the better of the world. What's next for you? Next for me, that's a good question. My important agenda for the medium term will be uh, making a success in that bank. I'm elected, I'm elected on the board. Uh, we are elected, I mean, 11 of us are elected on the board. But uh, we're waiting for confirmation of the National Bank. Once we confirm it, I think uh, we will be focusing on the establishment of this bank because uh, I, don't, I don't see that uh, a small task. There's a lot of competition. This bank has a um, sort of uh, double bottom line. We need to make a profit and we also need to address the social agenda of the bank. And uh, that would be my immediate focus. Given the chance, what would you love to do that you haven't done yet? Write a book. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you had one. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I had a couple of books, but it's more of a thematic thing. But it would be interesting to write a book about the women, what they have done, what's their talent, and what makes them do that. <laughs> Can you see yourself in politics? Um, I don't. I don't think so. I don't. Think, I don't think I'm like a political person. I, I'm more. I'm more a social change. Yeah. Because with your background. Yeah. Uh, I would vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> what words of wisdom? Would you give, or do you give, to your 11-year-old daughter? What I do is um, I allow her to be herself. And for some reason, 
that helps. Like when we walk into a supermarket, people come to me and say, Are you as to say to her, are you as brave as your mom? Do you want to be like your mom? She says, No. I want to be myself. And I like that because that is how she will be an independent woman. And already we have a lot of differences from the way she, you know, dresses for school, from the way she, she wants to be to do it her own way. I don't like it maybe, but but she has to do that. She has to keep that. So you hope she doesn't listen to this uh, interview. <laughs> To, to that, so be, just be being yourself, is, be yourself at that age and not be somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Which, yeah. Is, which is great advice and interesting yeah. enough we haven't heard it. Yeah. So, what do you wish that you were to told at that age? Um, I wish I was told that uh, I could be, I could be someone because I, especially from the former school, I did not get that. My teachers used to tell me that this girl is smart, unfortunately she's a girl. Unfortunately she's a boy. She, she's not a boy. So I wish they were saying she's a girl and she'll be someone, something. Mm. Yes. So what words of wisdom would you like to impart to African women? Words of wisdom. It, it depends on what they're doing, it depends on their calling. But I think if they are in public service in what they want for them, uh, I believe uh, if they have voice and if they have public trust, I believe they have to continue talking. They have to continue to fight. They have to continue to contribute to making the world a better place. If they are in business, I think they should never be afraid of failure. They should not listen to their doubts, they should listen to their hopes, and they will make it. Great words of wisdom, and great for entrepreneurs, don't listen to your doubts, listen to your hopes. Yes. And that can carry you a long way. Thank you so much, Anisa. You know, we haven't had the opportunity to talk to an activist, a uh, woman activist, as of yet, and it's great to get the insight from, from an Ethiopian perspective, but also looking around Africa and seeing where women have really been trailblazers. So I want to thank you very much for joining us. My name is Susanna Stevens, and I co-produce Wisdom Exchange TV with, with my husband, Michael K. Ginrich. We're traveling all over Africa interviewing women who are trailblazers, pioneers, leaders of many. If you know of a woman that we should interview, please email us at info at wisdomexchangetv.com. Also, if you work for or own an organization that would either like to sponsor this site or Africa Business Women Connected Summit, the information is actually on the site about ABW Connected and different sponsorship packages. We are drawing the top two business women across Africa to an international trade summit in Ethiopia. This program has started already with, with the launch of Wisdom Exchange TV. So do email us again at info at wisdomexchangetv.com. And I want to just leave you with uh, my final words of wisdom. And there's several things that, that came out. But I want to go back to women in violence. And we have the power to walk away. We just need to use that power. If we accept how we're treated, people will continue to treat us that way. But if we walk away, they, they will have no choice but to stop. Thank you for joining us.